in many ways it's intertwined. Even if I didn't get on a mat, the thinking, the being of it is intertwined in who I am. The arts are intertwined in who I am. What's happening, everyone? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 690. My guest today, Professora Bernadette Robinson. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of traditional martial arts. If you love what we do, maybe you should check out whistlekick.com. It's a place that we drop all kinds of cool stuff, all of our products and our projects. And if you find stuff over there you want to pick up, maybe a training program, a shirt, hat, something like that, use the code PODCAST15. Save you 15%, helps us connect some dots on the back end, knowing that what we put out here with the show means something to people. If you want to check out the show and go deeper on this or any other episode, we've got a separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Two episodes each week, all under the guise, all with the hope of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists global if that means something to you maybe you're willing to support us in our mission there are a lot of ways that you can help us out you could share this episode with someone you could pick something up in the store like i said we've got a patreon patreon.com slash whistlekick but if you want the whole list whistlekick.com slash family we don't link to that in fact that is something you've got to type in why because we want to make it worth your while so if you're willing to take that small step we know that you're really committed to what we're trying to do here and in exchange, we post bonus content, exclusive discounts. There's a bunch of stuff that goes into that page, and it's changing weekly. We're trying to do some big things, and we need your help now. Today's episode, we haven't done in-person episodes with a guest in a long time. But five minutes in, I was wishing we'd done this with, with this episode. Powerful episode with someone who I barely knew before. I recognized her. I could pick her out of a crowd, could say hi. That was about it. I came away from this episode feeling like, like I knew her, like we'd known each other for years. It was such a powerful conversation. And I hope that you have a similar reaction. I hope you enjoy it. So instead of waiting, here we go. Bernadette, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for thinking of me. You know, I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time, and, and I don't know all of the guests before they come on the show. And in fact, I would say most of the guests over the last few years I haven't met in person before. And I'm tr I, I was trying to remember when you first came on my radar. I think it was at Terry. Is it Terry Dow's? You teaching at the symposium. And just remembering in a in a sea of chaos. Is anybody who's been to that event? It's a wonderful event, but it is chaotic. In a sea of chaos, everybody training with you was always glued to you. There was always something about the way you were there, that, and that stuck with me. It's been years since I first observed that. So I'm glad that maybe through our conversation today, I'll get to understand a little bit about why you have that commanding presence and why people glue to you. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll find out. Yeah, it may not be something that I can describe. You may have to ask them, but let's go I for it. I might. We'll see what happens. So before we started the recording here, you, you mentioned that if we kick off with your origin story. We might get into some stuff. Yes. And let's, you know what? Let's do it. Let's go there. When did you start training? Well, there's an official year and then there's the non-official year. Mm. Um, so what people probably don't know is I'm, um, because this is radio, is that I'm 60 years old. I'm a Black woman and I live in Manchester, New Hampshire now, but I was raised on Long Island, New York. Um, and when I went to school there, obviously it was in the 60s. So we were there during the civil rights era and in time of much love you, hate you, you know, um, mm. love you, hate you era in the time that of change. There were a lot of things that were um, racially motivated in a in an area where there 
there weren't many minorities, but minorities were starting teeny weeny slowly to move in. Many of the times I was the only, my brother and I were the only black children in the school and definitely the only black children in our particular classes. So there was a lot of harassment. Um, Sometimes it was physical or attempted to be physical. And sometimes it was a lot was verbal. And then it was the unseen, the things that were said and felt that no one actually said out. And that group included adults. I became very um, self-conscious and literally what people don't know is I actually at one point stopped talking, period. Um, there would only be tears because because I was in a world that would not, no matter what, accept me as human being in their space. How old were you? Anywhere from kindergarten, the first time I stepped in school, I realized that I can tell you the first incident of sitting in a classroom in kindergarten, and I can tell you her name too, but I won't say it on here so that we don't cause embarrassment. Had um, This is how old I am. The big boxes of Crayola with the with the sharpener in the back, that was the first time that we had seen them. And she promptly stood up in class and said that everybody can choose a choose one of my crayons and use her crayons, except for you. And the teacher didn't stop it. And that was that was in memory was one of the um points of I'm not safe in this world. So things go on, you know, all kinds of things in in that time happened, most of which I don't remember, um, except for having a bunch of extreme, extreme, extreme anxiety and fear. And, And I wouldn't say paranoia, but as a child would be paranoid, not knowing what to trust and not to trust in my environment. We did have one Black teacher. She was the gym teacher, um, Mrs. Dodd. Um, So I remember her. Um, That was it. (laughs) That was it. There were two women. One was a girl and one was a woman. And then my brother was somewhere running around school. (laughs) And, um, you know, and it was a lot. But I didn't know the world. The only world I knew that was from a toddler up where my mother had us immersed in the churches that were mostly black, but we lived in a white neighborhood. So, so I heard all of those words that our nice host and other radio shows use, <laughs> and even more than that, you know, and physical, physical attack. And around sixth grade, we had this thing called the weekly reader, and, and you would be able to go in the weekly reader and pick your book. They had a girl section and a boy section. That's how old I am. And you could only pick from your section. So I promptly did not pick from my section. And I picked a book called Every Boy's Judo. And I circled it and it comes in a paper bag so no one knew what I had. And from that point, I took it home. And so was I in sixth grade? That was in sixth grade-ish because back then sixth grade was still part of elementary school. And then we moved into, you know, middle school and seventh. So in sixth and seventh grade, I remember putting up, I lived in the basement. My bedroom was in the basement, putting clothes up in my closet on hangers and trying to do the moves that they were showing, which were nicely penciled. They didn't have this big illustration and we didn't have YouTube or anything. So you were literally reading it, looking at stick figures or, you know, or poorly drawn things and trying to figure out technique, which at the time I didn't know as technique, but I knew it was something that I could do if someone touched me here or there. Um, and that's how I practiced. So, so I, I'm, you're sixth grade, so that's about 12 and you're- Yeah, 11. Yeah, I was 11, 11 and I turned 12 in sixth grade, yeah. Okay. And you're, you're practicing hip tosses with spare with with other clothes that are hanging up like you you kind of you're i mean that's that's ingenious i've never heard of anyone doing that but you've got infinitely manipulatable limbs there you can you can get in position and yeah i love it and and you know for for me you know it's it's funny because was i practicing yes but what was happening on the flip side is i was starting to build confidence that i didn't have to always be afraid 
Mm-hmm. So, so the technique probably not so good with a hanger and a shirt um, and no feet. <laughs> but, um, but the idea that I wasn't and didn't have to be helpless forever mm-hmm. was the mm-hmm. main idea. I probably did not know that at the time, but in hindsight, I definitely understood that to be. Do you do you think there was something? You know, because again, it wasn't something conscious. But do you think there was an unconscious instinct drawing you in that direction? You know, because it sounds like you had to jump through some hoops. You know, you had to pick from the boys section. You had to get this book. You had to construct your own training dummy. That that's those are obstacles. A lot of kids at 11, 12 years old aren't going to try to overcome those obstacles. So there must there was a reason in there somewhere. If it wasn't Fear. conscious, you think it was unconscious? Fear. Fear. Okay. Fear. If you walk through life fearing that you are going to be eliminated from life or elimination at some points feels like it's better than continual torture. So was I being tortured? No, I was in the middle of a crisis that the um, entire country at least was in. But for a little body and a little mind, it felt like torture. Your friends are limited. Your words are limited. You can on some days walk into people's house and other days you can't, depending on who is looking at their house. You can be friends with someone one day. You can't the next day, depend on who was criticizing their family. So so the context is is so wide it's, it's almost, I almost can't describe it. And then the idea of needing to be, to have a bit of perfection, find its way in, because if you're less than perfect, then you just keep rolling closer to the bottom of the heap of what people consider trash. What, what were the conversations like at home around the physical self-defense. I mean, probably I'm guessing didn't use those word, that word self-defense at that time, but was there conversation among within your family about staying safe? Did that inspire was, any of this? There were several conversations um, in, in that time period that I remember. Now that depends on if you're talking about family on Long Island or family in Brooklyn. So the majority of our family lived in Brooklyn, New York, in in a black community, black and Hispanic community. You know, um, that was it. And when you go there, it's you better not lose that fight. If somebody hits you, you hit them back. You better not lose. You better put up your fist or you get your butt kicked by me. Mm. So there was some of that. It was mostly for the boys, but I was listening hard. <laughs> and and at in the neighborhood with my my grandmother, um, I call her my grandmother. It was very much, don't say too much. You keep your head down. When people send out Valentines to everybody, you don't send them. You don't send those little cards to little boys because they will come and burn this house down. So there are there there are opposing things, you know, in in that world. In 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 one world, when I went to the city, when I called it the city, when I went to the city, you talk like a white girl. And over here, I was the N word all day, you know, Um, or or this cute little thing. Isn't she so well behaved? That's not how you talk to other people, but that's how you talk to my mother when you see me. Oh, she's so clean. Of course, I'm clean. You know, so so you pick up on these things and it it kind of shapes and colors um, what you think you need to defend yourself against and when you can feel free. And living caged, even if the cage isn't around you like a jail or a bird cage, there's still a cage. And the idea to be free um, is always I call, for me, I'd say it's always on the front porch and it's always looking up. It's what I see in the sky before street lights when you could actually see stars and shooting stars. Okay. Now that sounds like the unofficial start. Yes. 
Where's the official one? The official start was in 1979 at a place called Country Sports Academy in Monticello, New York. I signed up there to be um, a track and field um, assistant coach with, you know, it was a big, it was a very rich um, area. It, it, the area was, I guess, I guess the area was rich, but it was rich people from all over, from Tel Aviv, from everywhere came to go to this camp. Um, European and not many dark people, but from other parts of the world that were, um, and they came there to work with the best coaches um, in in the world, you know, and, and I was on this track. I was a runner. Um, originally, I was a track a sprinter, and I was good, so I got hired to there. Is, is um, this after high school? Sounds like right that was about there. The last, yeah, last year of okay. high school. That was my camp. Went to camp. Um, camp meaning that was work. Sure. And um, you know, and I did the track. I did the track running for a, a few weeks, and who eventually came my first sensei. Ken Freeman and his wife, Ruth, were there, um, and he was the judo instructor. And he noticed something um, because of my confidence. And although he never put it in words, Ruth put it more into words um, that they could not, that they thought that I was <clears throat> vulnerable to um, being preyed upon by people, men, older boys in the camp. Um, we were in shorty shorts back then. That's the day when they put on the, you know, almost bathing suit bottoms to run, you know? And um, he said, come over here. <laughs> and the dojo was in the, right next to the track. And he was like, put this thing on. It looked like a, a bag. And he was like, that's what you'll wear. Okay. And he's like, now you're over here. And that was it. And I started judo. Now, anybody who knows the history of, of martial arts in the United States knows that judo had a pretty strong foothold for a long time. But 1979, it's starting to fade. And I'm just I'm kind of blown away by the whether you want to call it coincidence or good fortune or kismet that you identify judo as a thing and you start practicing it and seven years seven ish years later right you randomly end up at this camp with these people who know judo and i think it's relevant to the story so i'll ask were they white yes he was from um christ church barbados though so okay. he, he lived in, and it's still named for him, the dojo there. Um, okay. it, it was in Christchurch, Barbados. So yes, he was white, but he lived and ran a school in Christchurch, Barbados. Okay. So, so there's another element to whatever we want to call this, this confluence of circumstances, someone who likely had a better understanding of what your life might be than the average person. Yes, most definitely. This is blowing my mind, right? Like this sounds like it could only, it, it, it had to happen that way. It sounds like one of those stories. Mm -hmm. Did you, now the, the, you described it as a bag. Was he having you put on a gi? Yes, that was a gi. Did you recognize <laughs> it from, from the book? Uh, yeah, I recognize what it was, but it still felt like a bag compared to short. <laughs> and it was hot. That's the days, that's in the days when summers were hot. Sure. <laughs> Okay. And, and so how did it go? Um, yeah, it went, <laughs> it went really well. I started to, you know, at first it was like shock, but the shock wasn't as much. I wasn't that, you know, worried about leaving the track program, but the shock was that I couldn't believe that someone saw what I already knew could have been the possibility of my trajectory. Mm. So there are those things that we have in Jahari's window that are hidden, that we know, but other people don't know. But he knew it and he saw it and they saw it. They were a couple and she did not do judo, 
but she they were definitely a Mac, they were a married couple. So that thing that 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 loneliness and stuff that may have been hidden from other people, and that you know, whatever it is the energy that in and when you talk to people, when you're around people and the things the perception was there. Now I'm a perceptive person, so I knew it too. Mm. But at times when you're 17, 18 years old, you go with the flow and you watch the flow and you say, if that's how I'm gonna get my attention, I'm going for it. But I got the the foot got in the door before I even gotten good at it. <laughs> so my game, I was like, I can go this game here. At least I know people like me and I can affirm that I'm not ugly and that I'm not a big lip monster and all the things that I had been called from childhood. But that foot got in that door and that door was shut. <laughs> so that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> it was done. Do, do you remember what it was like? Because I'm sure there were there was plenty of overlap in the movements you practiced at home and the movements you're practicing with people. It it reminds me of, if you know the story of Pele, he started playing soccer with like a ball of rags and got really good. And then they're like, here's a soccer ball. And he went, Oh, this doesn't move the same way. Was it similar for you? Um, Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. But I guess I've never thought about it that way. I thought about it as all new because Mm. I think when I was younger, I was wrapped up in the fear of protecting myself and not the technical aspect. So the override was I'm doing this and I'm gaining confidence, but it wasn't technical. It was doing something to gain the confidence. So that's a yes. And it's a yes, both ways, I guess to kind of say. Okay. How'd it go? You're in there. You're clearly, you're an athlete. Yeah. Some, some physical awareness, some context for what you're doing. Did you, did you crush it right off the bat? Um, it took used to, if anyone has done martial arts, if anyone has done judo, you will understand that you can run all day and it takes a different something out of you. There's a fortifying experience that comes from hitting the ground, your body starts to build an armor. Um, and that's not this, that's not the same. Yes. In, in running for me and a lot of other sports, you'll build musk, you'll build muscle and things like that, but the muscle and the, um, awareness of hitting and reverberation from a floor, it's not, it's just not the same. And I don't know how to put it into words but it's like i all i think of is teenage mutant ninja turtles where it builds a shell it yeah. builds there's a shell on the inside so there's my organs and then there's a shell and then there are my muscles and then there's the skin and you know it, it it's kind of a different setup that i feel and knowing that when i look at um anatomy and physiology it may not describe what I feel in my body the way that I experience it. And the only word I can use is fortified. So the mat helped to fortify. Being close to the ground helped to fortify my physical body and strengthen my body and my mind and my spirit at the at, at, you know, at the same time. Hence, I also then left the went to Springfield College, which is spirit, mind, and body. That's their Mm. model. (laughs) So, um, so yeah, so that's what it felt like to me. And that felt comfortable because I felt like I was building another layer of defense against the world. How long were you training there? Was it just that summer? Um, one, two, three, I can't remember three, four summers. Okay. Yeah. Any... Any training outside of the summers? Did you leave and say, you know, I got to keep doing this? Well, yes. So, so you worked the summer and then um, Sensei knew I was moving to Springfield College and he said, this is who you will train with. And he is still living. His name is Nuri Ashikudo. 
Kudo Sensei in Springfield, Mass. And that's where I started training. I did track and field for my scholarship in the day. And, and then I would walk to Kudos and do judo and Ishimuru, um, which I don't remember much of at at night. I think like two days started off two days a week or something like that. There are so many ways that we could go <laughs> from from here. And I'm 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 trying to move forward while while acknowledging that my mind is kind of blown at this this set of events. We we don't have, you know, everybody's story is different. And and that's one of the things I love about the format of the show. But once in a while we get somebody's story who it feels like there's outside influence, however you want to look at that. But you know, what you're saying, it's just the if we were to look at the statistical probability of these things all stacking together, it's insane. It, it, it's statistically all but impossible. So, wow. So, so I'm going to put that in my words, and I don't know if it's what you mean, but I come from, um, with all of its, its deficits and joys, I come from a family of of ministers and mm. there's a hand there's a hand guiding i hear i know what i there's a trajectory and and if you say your life is blessed or god has his hand on you or whatever i i was chosen for a direction for a reason i could have been a drug addict right to escape the pain i could have been working on the streets when there was not time times that i never didn't have money and didn't know how i'd get to go from place to place i could have been in a psychiatric hospital because i allowed my mind to go to places where they could should not go and thought about ending my life because there was not a place for me in this world so i understand very clearly that i am blessed mm -hmm. And and that is personally how I look at things like this, but this is your story, not mine. So mm -hmm. I try not to lay my own um, context, my own perspective on there. That's okay. I lay it out there. <laughs> By all means, do it. All right. So training in the summer, training at school, training, training. At some point you graduated. You're four years into organized training at that point i i would imagine that if you kept doing it alongside what you had to do for your college scholarship it wasn't just a thing that you did casually i watched a lot of people when i went to school had hobbies and most of those hobbies fell away unless they were super passionate mm -hmm. so i think it's fair to say probably graduating college super passionate about your training yeah. What next? Uh, um, I, I, so it was, but for me also, it was a, it was a life-saving measure in a sense. It was a defense against the world. So why would I give it up? And, and, and the people who cared outside of my mother, so I don't want to go down that avenue today, but outside of a very few people, they were the people who knew if I were missing. There wasn't anyone else that knew. If I didn't show up, I just, where was I? Right? I could have been anywhere on the earth or not here anymore. So, so kudos, since he wants to know where I am, you know, um, and, and, and get in here and, and do this thing. And the idea of not, um, and it's not a very direct thing. So it's not like you see on TV, you can't quit, you can't quit. But the idea of being in the present says that you can't quit, that you're worth fighting for, that your life is worth fighting for. And if this is how it's to be done, fine. And that you can also be a really good athlete in this thing. And you can be a good competitor in this thing um, in, in ways that, you know, in ways that may not have happened in, in other areas of life. Were you competing in judo? Yeah. How did that? How did that come about? I, yeah, Kudo said, "Is that application? Whatever." <laughs> like, he he said, "We're going. Whenever. You're going." Like, yeah, yeah. It was part of the game, you know. <laughs> how did that go? Does that was that something you enjoyed? It was. I had a lot of anxiety. Most of the people that were there were of the same mindsets of we're not far out of the history, right? 
of 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 this 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 inequality. And so oftentimes you're still the only black woman standing there, the only black girl standing there. And people say things and and you know and you just do it anyway. And it's and it and it's um and it's not my phrase, it comes from someone else I've heard say it. You do it afraid. You step on that mat afraid and it's okay. And even if you don't win it that time, you've already stepped on the mat. So the next time you will have less anxiety stepping on because you understand what will happen and you do it afraid and you allow your stomach to turn upside down and to feel like you're going to faint, like you have to pee a hundred times and you can't drink water and you do it anyway. Now here's, I and, and I, I think we can go here. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a gamble. I would imagine that judo competition was probably the first time you had permission across the board to respond, right? Anybody, anybody who's ever grappled, trained knows that you, there's a, there's a varying degree with how much force has to go in to make it work. You can make it work or you can put something extra onto it. Yep. I would imagine some of those people saying things to you in competition were people in your own division, whether they were genuinely trying to, whether they it was trash talk or whether it was something more. I wasn't there and I don't know that it matters. Yeah, I think it was it was mostly coaches. Okay. Most competitors I found very respectful, okay. but it was a weird phenomenon where after people would 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 do judo with me, they in in a couple of cases I should say not all the time, they would cry. And then someone on the sideline, and I can remember it's specific, and I'm not going to name names of other martial arts people, would say, you're a bully. I'm trying to survive like the other person. You put us in the cage together, you know, the gladiator, and you say, whoever comes out wins. But if I win, I'm the bully. So was that, was that statement a response to, and, and this kind of wraps in with my question, and, and let, me, let me ask it in a different way. Were you throwing them harder than you needed to? I have no idea. <laughs> I was getting the job done. So I was saving, you know, there's this, there's this backstory that people don't talk about. We talk about when I lose, it's all fine. People feel embarrassed when they lose. Sure. Right. There's a bit of humiliation that walks with you. There is a bit of eyes down. It's not automatically, okay, coach, what did I do and help me? You got to get to that point, right? You don't just jump right into it when you get off the mat. There's a sense of failure that you're overcoming. But that permission was literally, well, I'm literally is not the work right way, but I think it was taken from opponents whose coaches jumped in to tag me as something other, a bully, not cheating, <laughs> right? Doing the same thing, Epon is Epon, but I'm a bully. They don't get to go through their process of saying, this was fair. I didn't do well. What do we need to go back and do? Because it was a way of dismissing what what you did. Right. Right. And a way, and for them, dismissing their loss as some kind of a cheat. So how do they get to move to the next level if their opponent is seen as without saying the words cheating, they're cheaters. That's why you lost. So it doesn't help say any of the process. And, and, and I can't say that's not all the time, but these are the things that stand out in my head in, in, in at now being 60. Like, yeah, you probably didn't do that person much good in their longevity and being in the sport. Because when they don't have an excuse, then what are you going to do? What have you taught them? What are their next steps?
I think it was about a year ago, we had uh, Jean Kanakogi on, whose mother, Rusty, was instrumental in bringing women's judo yeah. forward. Were you still competing in those years? Were you able to rot, you know, kind of come up with that? I, I don't remember the years. Okay. So if you give me the years, I can tell you. When did women's judo hit the Olympics? It was 80, it was after I was in college. 80, 84, 88? Yeah, because I was I was in college. I graduated college in 82, 83. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> so old, 82 or 83, and it had not yet. And it was it was coming. So I think it was in somewhere around 84 to 88. Did you keep competing after college? Um, yes, but not as frequently. Okay. Because Were you I, still I got, in Springfield? Or had you um, moved on? I was in Springfield a little bit. Then I was in San Diego, California. And I went okay. to San Diego um, Judo Club just for a little bit. Um, it was weird. Um, are, you, are you willing to say more? Yeah, I wasn't from, and there was nothing about race. It was, oh, okay. I was from somewhere else. I wasn't from California. <laughs> okay. I was like, this is weird, you know. Um, and it was very much, again, if you come in and you're winning, and technical styles are different. So mm. if one sensei thinks that this is the way you do a technique, we we kind of think there's one way to do everything, which is ludicrous to me. Um, but um, so then you're doing it wrong. And I was like, I'm done. And by then, you know, I was a little older. I was trying to be a professional person, you know, in the world. And and so I probably did less judo around that time in a formalized way. But I would always find people to train with, like at, um, I can't remember if it was YMCA or Boys and Girls Club or something like that. What what did the arc of martial arts look like? for you after that, you know, it sounds like we, we've got these cycles of, of up and, you know, uh, frequent and less frequent. So you came into this, maybe a less frequent cycle, but at some point, because, you know, I, I know some of the, the more current aspects, at some point it came back up, you know, what, what did the next few years or so look like? Yeah, well, so in there, we're talking about marriage, kids, and all of that stuff, sure. <laughs> right? Um, but I still, I still, even through my kids, I managed to do, I still did judo. So, so my judo, when I moved to, I can't, what year Marcel is, Terry was two. I moved to, to New Hampshire 32 years ago. My son's third, my oldest is 34. Um, and I continued, I went right away into um, finding judo. Once I got to Manchester, I was in Lebanon for a few months and th that was not, there was nothing there. So, so I wound up, um, in Manchester working and I found, found judo. Um, there was a guy named, um, Art Clement, I believe was the first one and mm -hmm. he's long gone, but he worked at a high school. He was a science teacher in Hopkinton mm -hmm. and, um, in Hop Hopkinton, New Hampshire. And he had some mats up on a stage in the gym. And so I did judo with him. And then I moved to, um, to, um, Cal Potter at Portsmouth, very famously, the Portsmouth Judo Club in mm -hmm. Portsmouth. Um, and uh, Cal's passed recently, within the last year and a half, I think he passed away. But, um, and and I would drive from Manchester to there. So I was doing like three three days a week. I did a lot of judo. And, and for um, people not from the area, that's not like two towns over. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, at the time the roads were not good either. So it was about an hour drive to Portsmouth back yeah. then. Um, and in the middle of the night, one of my kids did judo. It's a it's a time when Jimmy Pedro and the Pedros were mm. very connected down there. And so, um, yeah, so so I still trained and competed, went to AMCANs and all that stuff um, all the way through. I trained a lot, you know, um, in, in early mother, you know, the early parts of motherhood, like after the you know, I trained a lot and I took my kids in strollers, um, to, to, to train, you know, mm -hmm. we put the sleeping bags down and I trained and it, it just, it, it was, you know, by that time it was a part of me. It's, it's, it's intertwined in many ways. It's intertwined. Even if I didn't get on a mat, the thinking, the being, the being of it is intertwined in who I am. The arts are intertwined in who I am. 
Um, and, and you're talking about moving. I had a hip replacement and elbow was a one, oh, three, I think, oh, two was pan and cans. And then I had a hip replacement in oh, three is when I started, I started earlier in that dabbling in um, the grappling here in Manchester at the, it used to be Gold's Gym mm -hmm. with a kid who I still work with. We, we've gotten back together now. He was 17 at the time and now he's 42. Um, <laughs> and, and, and we train two nights a week. We run classes together in Nashville, New Hampshire. I'm nourish your care. But I, but I, he, he showed, he showed it to me. I had done a little bit of wrestling. I wasn't allowed in college to wrestle really, but I could do the intramurals with the boys, you know, and stuff. Um, cause back then it wasn't girls wrestling. Wasn't right. Big. It wasn't there. So, um, yeah. So I was like, what are you guys doing? And I, I said, it looked like some kind of judo or something. It's like, Oh no, we're doing, um, we're doing grappling and that was it. We rolled out the mats on the gym floor, the wrestling mats on the gym floor and go to the gym and never turned around from that then. And I thought it was, um, not that it was a better option because I still did judo and I still do judo, um, just not in as much of a formalized way because with the hip replacement, I had to be careful for a long time. You don't want that thing to pop out. Sure. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so if I, if I'm doing the math, you know, how, depending on how you want to look at it, you're, you're finding, you're calling it grappling, but maybe I'm, I'm foreshadowing here, you know, was it, was it, was it jujitsu? Was it Brazilian jujitsu? It was very on the cusp. It was, and yes and no. So okay. Naga was around, um, not with, um, Kip Collar. Mm -hmm. Naga was around. Um, but it was mostly no gi stuff. Um, but then they had gi stuff. And then the tide started to turn. More people started, the gi stuff started coming more. So yes and no. There were um, people from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu there. Matter of fact, in that time is when I met um, Roberto Maya. Um, and I started traveling to Watertown to do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, because there wasn't much, there wasn't anything, I don't think, around. That's why I was traveling to Watertown sure. in the middle of the night. Um so it it kind of had a mix. It was kind of grappling and then gi grappling and then Brazilian jiu-jitsu, but Brazilian jiu-jitsu was coming more stronger from Brazil and other areas and being formalized at the time. A lot of the people I remember were speaking just Portuguese, but they were learning English. So it all kind of came, I was right in there in that we were time. There at yeah. Almost the, I, maybe not the beginning, but the early, some early periods here. In, in this area, yeah. right? It, it may have been other places. And the gi was more comfortable for me. I had been in the gi for my life, you know? Sure. And, I, and I think I didn't, I was 36 when I started um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. What was it like having, you know, two decades of judo under your belt, literally, and, and, and seeing, I guess we could say seeing combat or seeing that, you know, partnered human engagement in a certain way. And then, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, some injuries and, and wanting to be respectful of your body, but it's a, it's a whole different language. Mm -hmm. Grappling versus judo is a different language. Do you remember what, what you were thinking as you started seeing this and, and you, you express it as a better option at the time, but there must've been some light bulbs popping up for you going <gasps> because it was you know similar enough to relate but different enough that it's a whole different thing well i think there are two things i'll say on that one is it, it's more tools in my tool chest this tool mm -hmm. chest that by now was a little less prominent in my mind of confidence so so there were so there were other things to put into that tool chest sure. to take out when i needed to and and secondly I wasn't giving up judo. I was just learning more about martial arts, mm. right? And so people would tell me, oh, you have to get rid of that judo stuff, right? Um, it doesn't work anymore. And I just sit there and look at them like, 
that's because you can't do a takedown. <laughs> that's what I'd be saying in the back of my head. But, um, <laughs> but I just be like, mm, oh, that's not going to happen. You know, um, but but the mind has to, it's not a but, it's an and the mind has to open because the world presents us with many challenges in many different ways and many perspectives. Why would I stay in one perspective for, forever and not explore other perspectives? See it from another point of view. Makes sense to me. Okay. Where did it go from there? It's, it's still here. Is, is that we're, we're still we're still going? So is that is that because you were early enough in in BJJ? And and I'm not gonna say specific numbers, but I've seen the stripes on your belt. Never met a woman in the context of BJJ with more stripes on her belt. Was that also a battle? <laughs> Maybe if you only knew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. I'm guessing. Woo. So this is the point where even in class where I tell people and it's kind of how do I say it? it's not that it's against martial arts but don't get too wrapped up in that string tied around you because every person that's involved in, it's not one path one it's not one path for each person it's not always an equitable path if you are um, not in the in group. It's a path where you can be added to without continuing to work at it. All you have to do is be breathing and someone gives it to you because you're still alive. So, yeah, I love it and I'm, and I'm glad and people say it took me longer than the average bear to get it. Was it because of skill? <laughs> Were there people who started way after me that then rode themselves above me? <laughs> Let it be because they're not inside of me and they could never showing that and flapping it around and saying that you're higher than me means nothing. What you have not done is you have not built yourself into being Bernadette Rebecca Robinson. And that's what counts. What counts is every way that my life has benefited from doing this, from being able to sit here and talk to you now and not find, from being able in my current job to being able to be counsel and counsel the counselors on how to counsel other people, to work in when I was working in school, to work with families who have high potential and, and are held down by the facts of where life are right now. You can't replace that. So I don't care about your belt, you know, in many ways. I respect the work that people who really worked for it put into it but now you could go doop 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 on your typewriter and get on your I'm sorry I'm, that's how old I am on your keyboard and go to an ordering machine and get you one so I put it right there <laughs> that's that, that's that's as uh, um it's as good a response as I think anybody could come up with This is the point where I would typically ask why. Why are you still training? But you've, you've answered that. So let me ask that in a different way. What are you adding to your toolbox? You, you express something that, that I've expressed often on the show. People, longtime listeners know, you know, I don't, I don't train karate. I don't train taekwondo. I'm a martial artist. 
and it's all different tools. It all goes in the same box. It, it has applicability based on different situations. And if nothing else, it's fun. I enjoy it. Yes. Being that you've trained in a number of things, and don't think I missed the uh, the Ishinru reference. Yes. And the Capoeira. I'm new at that. <laughs> I think I was there when you when we did that at, when we did that at the symposium. That was a blast. Did a little bit of Capoeira in, in college. Yeah, it's 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 all good. It's all fun. Yeah. It all overlaps at least a little bit. So I'm sure there's the fun part. I'm sure there's the health part. I'm sure there's the this is something that is core to who I am. I've got to keep doing it. But I would be shocked if there wasn't also goals laid in there. Things that you are that are driving you. You 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 seem like someone who is motivated by whether it's external or internal pressures. So where is where is that motivation coming from, and what is it pushing you to? I think there might be questions that I ask myself when I think about that. If not me, then who? Mm. If not now, then when? Because every person that we we don't live, we talk about me, I, my, and mine, but we're too connected to, and, and that's because of how our language is set up, right? But that's not really the entire picture. My experience doesn't have to be duplicated by someone else, but someone may come in my path and need whatever energy it is or whatever word or whatever movement is, is to move to their next level. So if not me, then who? What good Service. is it to me to keep it in myself? And if not now, then when? When I can't get up and walk? Right? There are people who, without speaking, say, and it's not just about me, but they're saying to us, collective people around, I need you now. This is the way that I give. This is the way that I learn. And and I this is this is it is it is me. It's part of me. There are many parts of me, and this is a part of me. What I give and what I share, I also get back to, right? It's not a one-way street. When I have students on the mat, I get from them too. I don't, I don't do a lot of the holy praise me because I'm getting from you too. Without you, I don't have anywhere for that to go. You have to receive and I have to receive the energy in, in you that you have to keep me going, right? I can sit on the couch and I can do what many people do, no offense to anyone, and not move and 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 woe is me or i can be on the map with people you know some most 99.999 are younger and be able to absorb their energy to mimic them sometimes in movement to so that my life continues on it's a back and forth flow it's this is not a one it's a Sounds like an exchange. It's an exchange. It is an exchange. War, war in itself is an exchange. Ooh. It's keep going. Say more. We see it, we see it as a win or lose, but it's not. It's more of an exchange. It's 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 it in my mind, it's like a dance of words that I can't express how much I need this or I want that. And you can't express how much I need to keep it for myself, whatever the situation is. It's, it's an exchange. It's not a one way street. And, you know, and, and we can be, we can have those exchanges and be 
and have people winning and losing at the same time. They don't have to be win or lose. They can live side by side. When, if I, I don't want to get, I don't know how to say this and I don't want to, if people listeners are, 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 have fought in, in wars. I haven't, but I've had my own personal battles. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to take away from the fact that you look at our veterans. I'm just going to put it out there. Sure. We won this. So the question is, where are you now? What demons are you wrestling with now? So the win and lose goes side by side when we talk about these things of turbulence and war and and conflict and defense. I don't know how else to say it. Get it. It's, it's bringing to mind concepts around around balance and the idea that you know you can you can take without giving or, or, you know, unbalanced over here without, you know, the remainder having to go somewhere. Like it, it just, you know, whether you look at it metaphysically or, or physics, you know, it, it doesn't work. There's got, it's got to go somewhere. Yeah. And what I, what I'm hearing is instead of pretending otherwise, take the opportunity of that. Absolutely. And 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 I and in these days, you know, in my life, I believe about, or I believe, and I try to practice being open. Right? It's the hidden stuff with people with art that keeps us bound. And um, I don't want that person to be that person who's doing the same thing and calling everyone else wrong all the time because it's not the tradition, right? Um, and I believe in traditions and, and I do believe in that, but there are times that are difficult for me to watch. I, I think of it this way, I have two sons. Those are my only children. They're an extension of me. And if one of them is smarter than me, if one of them was doing jujitsu and was better than me, I'm pleased. I'm not fighting against them, still calling myself the best thing. I'm, I'm gonna, I, I think I want to stop there on that one. Sure. Because totally I have fine. a lot of feelings about... Um, how we how we do this thing and we don't do what we say um we just keep trying to hang on and sometimes it looks bizarre uh, I, I i suspect a lot of the people <laughs> listening know where you're going and they're probably nodding along as, as i am right now I, I i know where you're going and i know how sensitive a subject that can be and how deeply personal it can be because of the relationships that we build in martial arts and this this um frankly bizarre hierarchy that we construct and there's a there's an upside to it but there's also a downside to it and it takes a tremendous amount of personal growth to keep it positive indefinitely and i think a lot of people what i what i think i'm hearing you say is that some people run out of steam and that positive approach doesn't always remain indefinitely yeah there's a sadness so when i sit in these big gatherings of of the martial arts wonders of the world which i do believe in all that they should be honored. Their skill may not be where it was, so we're not gonna pretend about that, um, <laughs> right? They, they are to be honored. They're not gods. Maybe it's only the places I've been, but inevitably I sit in those big gatherings 
and someone comes up to talk about people and it sounds like sadness. They're saying joy and there's tears. And, and I sit back and I say, what are we wrestling with here? And so this thing that's standing up and it becomes this kind of, <laughs> and, 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 and I just sit back and I go, we're wrestling with principalities. We're wrestling with the fact that life changes. We're wrestling with the fact that, that our bodies are not the same and that's okay because we're beings and human beings. And that's not a negative. We are human beings in the most positive sense of the word. That's what happens. It is the process and love the process. Growth isn't always physical. And I think a lot of us, you know, we, we've spent a tremendous amount of time on this show talking about ego and the, the failings of ego because it, it's, it's a two-edged sword. Ego can be incredibly motivating, but if unchecked, it can be uh, destructive. And yeah. in the martial arts, we so often hold up skill physical prowess as the most valuable element of what we do. I don't, but as a collective industry, we certainly do. And if that is what someone hangs their proverbial hat on, they mm -hmm. get older and now their skill starts to deteriorate, yep. but they haven't spent time valuing all the other things that they do or could have as a result of their training. Mm -hmm. And we all try to remain the hero in our own story and those things start collapsing on us. And, you know, a wounded animal in the corner is pretty darn dangerous and wounded yeah. ego can be just as vulnerable. Yeah. It... Yeah. I, I don't even think people really understand the difference between the id, the ego and the super ego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, so that's for another day. That's time. another day. Yeah. You're throwing me back to uh, <laughs> high school psychology class. Yeah. Um, but yes, yes, there's. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't do the, um, you know, sometimes I've, I've been asked to do and I don't get asked to do a lot of um, I know my stuff. I know I know it but I don't get asked to do a lot of things in seminars and stuff. But when I do, people ask me, oh, list all of your accomplishments. And I don't do it. <laughs> we should have a conversation offline. <laughs> yes. I, I understand. What's accomplished was yesterday. Hmm. Don't spend too much time in yesterday. I got life to live. <laughs> well said. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, one of the things that, 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 that and this is actually a work thing and people take it to say as a martial arts thing, you might know the saying, when, how's it go? When the, when the student comes to teach, when, when the, the student's student ready, the master ready, will appear. The master will appear. Yeah. And I, I just, I was on the beach one day and I just dissected that to pieces. And because people just use it, right? And they use it in like, well, you have to be ready. And then the master's going to come. And I wrote this whole thing on my, and I have a flip phone on my cell phone of how ego-laden that is for a teacher or a, or a master. And that, again, one needs the other. You're not a master if there's not mastery over content and person. You're not a teacher if there's not mastery over content and you have a student or willingness to follow you. You're not a teacher if you have not gone through the process of being a student and gaining your learning first. 
Mastery is a powerful word. Continue, continue, continue. It's not an end word. Sometimes we get in the arts and the person standing in the run the room thinks it's an end game. <laughs> and it's not. Mastery is continuing. I don't know. And I can be I crazy. Agree. I agree. I can be nuts out of my mind. Well, so I'm, I'm right that's there how with I you. see it. <laughs> I'm right there with you. I think I think so often when when people make that statement. They, they voice that cliche. They envision it like a movie that I'm going to get to this certain point. I'm going to train so hard. And then this monk is going to walk down the road and knock on my door and say, you're ready. And that's not life. And that master isn't necessarily one person. It's not necessarily long term. It, it could just be this tiny little thing. And, and to me, it's and, and I think we're on the same page here. If you just shut up and listen, pay attention to what's going on around you, there's a tremendous amount of educational opportunity and it's not confined to martial arts. Yeah. That little thing about myself I need to tell you. <laughs> I agree with you in your last, and I think we're on, we agree in that way. You said monk. All I see when people talk about that is that rat from the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I would love for Master Splinter to knock on my door. That would be I amazing. Just say. <laughs> I I grew up, so you know, we got a couple of years between us. But I grew up. I mean, I was I was hot on the on the Ninja Turtle craze, right? I, there, there's a picture we've put it up in the past of me dressed as Raphael in a um, a town parade where I was literally painted green because that was the best that we could do. And just like head to toe green and masks and, and um, you know, I was training with Sai at the time. So it all worked out. But I, I, I think, you know, as unlikely as it would be and as concerned as I think a, a human being should be at an, uh, a, a large sized rat walking on two feet, I would probably still be happy to see that happen. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how, and it probably comes from raising my kids in that teenage mutant ninja turtle age. That I, every time somebody says something, just a rat shows up. <laughs> what could be better than a rat showing up? I know. I, I know you're kind of uh, low key in terms of contact information. Is there a way people can get a hold of you? Are you open um, to that? I, I guess I'm, I think I'm looking at Facebook, and it's going out of style. I, I guess it looks like less people are on it. That is um, true. I don't have, um, I, well, I didn't think I had Instagram, but someone said I do because I have people <laughs> following me. <laughs> I don't know how it got there. And, um, you know, your, your Facebook is probably the best way. I will probably pay more attention to it. My email, I start deleting things if they're not recognizable. Sure. So you might, someone might, um, for now, while Facebook is still in, so people can track you down by by Facebook. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And track me, not my mother. We have the same name. Oh, okay. Um, does, and does not she... my restaurant because my restaurant also has the same name. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there are there pictures of of you and a gi on on those other two pages? Uh, not even on my page. Oh well, then that <laughs> my, my page is my son from when he was in Boardwalk Empire. The the um oh cool yeah my son's an actor. Um, so it's him sitting on a thing with a straw and a thing in his hat. But I'm gonna change it soon, so you'll probably see. Well, me again. then then this this feels like a very uh, um somehow this all this cliche always gets confined to Chinese martial arts. Like you're gonna have to hunt if someone yeah. wants to get a hold of you. They're gonna have to hunt to track you down and do some work. You know, how ready are you? Well, people really know who I am. And we're going to go back to the beginning on this one because you, they say, oh, who's that black lady in New Hampshire that does Marshall Bernadette? <laughs> and, and that's where it comes up. Maybe there's other people out there now, but that was it. So usually I'm, I'm in the first name or two. <laughs> that that kind of that kind of not quite, but almost closes a circle. That's that's a journey. <laughs> so for the, the people listening who've been on this ride, listen to this journey today, what advice would you give them? 
So, so we talking about people, martial artists, or yeah. people, anyone? You can you can make it broader, but you know, ninety nine plus percent of the people who listen are going to be martial artists. It's your own journey. Don't give it up and make it someone else's journey. No one gets to drag you along or gets to tell you how to have the journey. You are in control of your own joy and misery. So keep an eye on that. I would say, I mean, I would say, I don't want to tell, I, well, I would say to have some kind of a practice that keeps you in tune with yourself. Bless whatever is serving you really well in the arts and, and bless the things that are not serving you well because those things are going to teach you about you. So everything that comes in and out is a part of who we are, positive, negative, joy, grief, sadness, sorrow, elation, desire. It is all a part of our beautiful human experience and allow it to happen. It's our choice whether we want to stop at turbulence and just stay there. I think that is a choice. So if you choose that, power to you. But you can make another choice. And there are things that happen in life that are heart-wrenching and heartbreaking. I will say, even in those times, you can give yourself time out from grief and allow yourself a moment to breathe and learn breathing and allow yourself to move forward unless you are calling at the end. A plug for who I am as a person, if you are feeling distressed, have mental health issues, have substance issues, reach out to someone. Know who to trust first and reach out. It's not beyond us as martial artists to be caught up in some of the same scenarios as everyone else in life. I would say to my ladies out there, mostly, but I will tell you, I've spoken to men too. If you're in a place that's toxic, which we didn't talk about, maybe I'll have to come back again. If you're in a place that's toxic and you don't know what the, the motivation of the people around you are, that is part of your training in your self-defense. You don't have to stay there. Find people that you can go to. Stop your membership. You did not sign up for abuse. There is no school without your money. And you don't have to, nor should you be berated into thinking that you're less than other people. If you, if you quit, that is up to you. I don't choose to quit, but I might choose a different road. And that's okay. We don't all resonate with each other and that's okay. But if someone is abusing you, if you are experiencing domestic violence within or violence within your dojo, or if you are family connected, domestic violence, you need to seek out help. That is not part of a good martial arts experience. It's not just what we do. Don't let people tell you that lie. Have fun. I say family first. Someone comes to me and says, I can't come to class. I can't come family first because I'll go away one day and you still have your children. And if you're married, your husband, and if you're maybe your mother and your aunts and uncles, you still have that. That's your primary. That's your core. All of the rest of this might go away. Look what happened at COVID. There's a teaching in COVID that says, who are we without it? And we are still us. When we can't go to the mat, we are still us. Those of us, we still carry the values and the things, the greatness of our art with us. And my personal mantra is find a way. And then we find a way to get the work done or as much as we can, even when we can't be on the mat, if that's what we're choosing to do. I mean, I don't know what else beyond that but to tell people.
if you're still here, it means you listen to the whole thing. Some pretty good stuff there, wasn't it? The more I reflect on this episode, the less I have that I can say, because I keep feeling more. There's a lot that I feel about this episode, and some of it is positive. Some of it is painful, but all of it's powerful. And I really want to thank Bernadette for coming on the show and her willingness to speak so openly on some sensitive and incredibly personal subjects. I'm glad we had the opportunity, and I'm glad that you all have the opportunity to listen as well. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for coming on. I'll see you soon. If you want to support us, if you like episodes like this, if you want to make sure that they keep coming, you got a ton of ways you can you can do that. Buy something or share an episode or Patreon or, or leave a review. Whistlekick.com slash family. Bring me into your school for a seminar. I do seminars. I travel all over the place for this stuff. And they're, they're fun. People have fun and they learn. I mean, what, what's better than that? I have fun and I learn. Everybody wins. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes. We're on every social media platform you could think of at Whistlekick. My email is jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you've got guest suggestions or feedback or anything like that, I want to hear it. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.